English listening. Topic 1. Back pain. Today's Health Council is presented by Paula Clayberg, who is the Chief Counselor at Liverpool's famous pain clinic, the Wilton Clinic. Paula. Do you know what Prince Charles, Seve Ballesteros and Elizabeth Taylor have in common? They all suffer from chronic back pain. In fact, bad backs are one of the most common health problems today, affecting people in all walks of life. The most recent available figures show that about a quarter of a million people are incapacitated with back pain every day. And many sufferers don't know the cause or the solution to their problem. The majority of our patients at the clinic tend to be women. They are especially vulnerable because of pregnancy, but also because of osteoporosis, which I personally believe to be the major cause of problems for women. I have many women patients who say they have completely given up exercise because the pain makes them so miserable. But of course, that starts up a vicious circle. Bed rest, giving up exercise and painkillers are traditional responses to back pain. But although there are many excellent drugs on the market, at our clinic, we're beginning to realize the unique benefits of relaxation therapy. Other specialists in the field make a strong case for certain types of exercise, but in our experience, they are easily mishandled and can lead to more harm than good. Now let's look at some of the reasons why back pain is developing into such a unique menace. In general, the body is pretty good at self-repair. A strain or a blow to a limb, though painful at the time, generally resolves itself. But the body's response to back injury can be very counterproductive. When pain strikes, we attempt to keep the back as immobile as possible, which makes the muscles tense up. Research shows that they often go into spasm, which causes further twisting of the spine. A vicious circle is underway. The second mistake we often make when stricken with extreme back pain is to go to bed and stay there. Although at the clinic, we recognize that a short rest in bed can be helpful, up to two days, any longer makes our back muscles become weaker and unable to hold up our spine. The pain therefore becomes worse. Another problem is being overweight. Anyone a stone or more overweight who already has back pain is not doing himself any favors. Though it won't actually set it off in the first place, the weight will increase the strain and make things worse. The British diet could be partially to blame for the increase in back pain. Over the last 10 years, the average weight of men has risen by 11 pounds and of women by 9 pounds. So much for the causes and aggravations of pain. But what can we do to help? There are many ways in which simple day-to-day -day care can make all the difference. The first point to watch, of course, is weight. If you are overweight, a diet will make all the difference. Also, studies have shown that just one hour sitting in a slouched position can strain ligaments in the back which can take months to heal. At the clinic, we have come to the conclusion that the major cause of the problem is not with the design of chairs, as some have suggested, but in the way we sit in them. It can be useful to get special orthopedic chairs, but remember, the most important improvement should be in our posture. Another enemy of your back is, of course, your beds. If your bed doesn't give enough support, back muscles and ligaments work all night trying to correct spinal alignment, so you wake up with a tired, aching back. Try out an orthopedic mattress or a spring slatted bed. Research shows that both can be beneficial for certain types of back pain. Another hazard for your back 
are the shock waves which travel up your spine when you walk, known as heel strike. A real find for our patients has been the shock absorbing shoe insert, a cheap but very effective solution. And you might be better off avoiding shoes with heels higher than one and a half inches. Though absolutely flat shoes can be a solution for some, others find their posture suffers. Finally, a word about the state-of-the-art relief, the TENS machine. A small battery-powered gadget which delivers subliminal electrical pulses to the skin. Our experience indicates that your money is better spent on the more old-fashioned remedies. Topic 2, the University Helpline. Hello everybody and welcome to this informal meeting about the University Helpline. The Helpline was set up 10 years ago by the Students' Union and it aims to provide new students to the University with a service that they can use if they need information about practical areas of student life that they're unfamiliar with. Let me give you some examples of the type of help we can offer. We can provide information on financial matters. For example, you may feel that your grant is insufficient to see you through college life, or you may have some queries regarding the fees you're paying if you're an overseas student. In both cases, the helpline would be able to go through things with you and see what the outcome might be. Another area we can help with is what we generally term the domestic area, things such as childcare and the availability of nursery provision, for example, come under this. Then there's academic issues that may arise while you're in the early stages of your course that you may not know what to do about. You may wish to know more about essay deadlines, for example or how to use the library. There are all kinds of questions you will find yourself asking and not knowing where to get quick answers from. The helpline would be able to provide these. The last example I've given here is simply termed social. And yes, there is a lot of social life here, but you may have a particular interest you wish to pursue or you may wish to participate in outings or trips if you don't know many people at the moment. Let me give you some details so that you know where to go and who to see if you want to pay us a visit. Generally, you'll see our helpline officer, Jackie Kouachi. That's K-O-U-A-C-H-I. Jackie is a full-time employee of the Student Union and she works in the Student Welfare Office. That's the office that deals with all matters related to student welfare. And it's located at 13 Marshall Road. I have some maps here for those of you who haven't been there yet. If you wish to ring the office, the number is 326 9940. That's 326 9940. The office is open between 9.30 and 6 o'clock on weekdays and from 10 to 4 on Saturdays. And there'll be somebody there, usually Jackie or myself, between those times. If you want to make an appointment, you can phone or call at the office in person. Please note that it may not be possible for anyone to see you straight away, particularly if it's a busy time, lunchtime for example, and you may have to go on the waiting list and then come back later. Well, enough from me. Any questions? Topic 3, the Sports Centre. So, I'll hand over now to Julie Brooks. Thank you. Welcome to the Sports Centre. It's good to see that there are so many people wanting to find out about our sports facilities. First of all, membership. All students at the college are entitled to become members of the Sports Centre for an annual fee of £9.50. 
To register with us and get your membership card, you need to come to reception between 2 and 6 p.m., Monday to Thursday. I'm afraid we can't register new members on Friday. So it's Monday to Thursday, 2 to 6, at reception. Now, there are three things that you must remember to bring with you when you come to register. They are your union card, a recent passport size photograph of yourself, and the fee. It doesn't matter whether you bring cash or cheque. We can't issue your card unless you bring all three, so don't forget your union card, passport photo and fee. Then once you've got your sports card, you will need to bring it with you whenever you come to book or use any sports centre facilities. Booking over the phone is not allowed, so you have to come here in person with your card when you want to book. Our opening hours seem to get longer every year. We are now open from 9am to 10pm on weekdays and from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays. For those of you who are up and about early in the morning, we're introducing a 50% morning discount this year. This is because the facilities tended to be underused in the mornings last year. It means that all the sessions will be half price between 9 a.m. and 12 noon on weekdays. So, what exactly are the facilities? What sports can you play here? Well, this room we're in at the moment is called the main hall and it's used mainly for team sports such as football, volleyball and basketball but also for badminton and aerobics. On the other side of the reception area there's the dance studio. This provides a smaller, more intimate space which we use for ballet, modern dance and martial arts. Not at the same time, of course. Then, in a separate building, which you may have noticed on your way here, it's on the other side of the car park, there are the squash courts, six of them. And at the far end of the building, a fitness room. This is our newest facility, only completed in the spring, but it's already proving to be one of the most popular. As well as all these facilities available here on the campus, we also have an arrangement with the local tennis club, which is only two miles away, entitling our students to use their courts on weekday mornings in the summer. So, I think that there should be something here for everybody, and I hope to see all of you at the centre making use of the facilities. If, in the course of the year, you have any suggestions as to how the service we provide might be improved, or its appeal widened, I'll be interested to hear from you. Topic 4, Ted Hunter. Today I'd like to introduce Ted Hunter, who used to rear sheep and poultry, but who is here to tell us about a rather unusual type of livestock that he's been concentrating on in the last few years. Ted Hunter is a member of the Domesticated Ostrich Farming Association, and is here to tell us about the possibilities of breeding and rearing these birds in this country. Thank you, Paula. When you look at international restaurant menus and supermarkets, they all tend to feature the same range of meats. Beef, lamb, chicken, pork, that sort of thing. But people are always interested in something different. And we're now finding that farming can bring new types of meat to our tables. The kangaroo is one animal that's now being farmed for its meat and eaten outside Australia where it comes from. It looks and tastes rather like rabbit though it's slightly darker in color. But it is rather tough, so that's a problem for some people. Uh, crocodiles are also being farmed for their meat. This is rather like chicken, pale and tender, and it's getting quite fashionable. Some people also find it's rather fatty, but I think it makes a really tasty sandwich. Now, a third type of meat becoming increasingly available, and the one that I think is by far the nicest of the three, is ostrich which most people say has a similar taste and texture to beef. However, it's much better for you than beef, as we'll see later. 
Most people think of ostriches as wild animals, but in fact, ostriches have been farmed in South Africa since around 1860. At first, they were produced for their feathers. In Africa, they were used for tribal ceremonial dress, and they were also exported to Europe and America, where they were made into ladies' fans and used for decorating hats. Later, feather fans and big decorated hats went out of fashion, but ostriches were still bred, this time for their hide. This can be treated to produce about half a square meter of leather, very delicate, fine stuff, of very good quality. At the same time, some of the meat was used for biltong, the air-dried strips of meat popular in South Africa as a sort of fast food. However, recently there's been more and more interest in the development of ostrich farming in other parts of the world, and more people are recognizing its value as a food source. Ostrich meat is slightly higher in protein than beef, and much lower in fats and cholesterol. It tastes good, too. A series of European taste tests found that 82% of people prefer ostrich to beef. And one ostrich produces a lot of meat, from around 30 to 50 kilograms, mostly from the hind quarters of the bird. Farmed ostriches don't need African climates. And in fact, ostrich farming is now becoming well established in other parts of the world. However, setting up an ostrich farm isn't something to embark on lightly. Mature breeding birds are very expensive. Even a fertilized ostrich egg isn't cheap. So you need quite a bit of capital to begin with. Then the farmer needs special equipment, such as incubators for the eggs. The young chicks are very dependent on human minders and need a lot of attention from the people looking after them. In addition, ostriches can't be intensively farmed. They need space and exercise. But in spite of this, they make good farming sense. A cow produces only one calf a year, whereas a female ostrich can lay an egg every other day. And because the farmers can use incubators and hatched chicks are nourished well and protected from danger, the failure rate on farms is very low indeed. And almost all the fertilized eggs will hatch out into chicks, which will in turn reach maturity. This is very different from the situation in the wild, where the vast majority of chicks will die or be killed before they grow up into mature ostriches. So it's possible, once the initial outlay has been made, for the farmer to be looking at very good profit margins indeed. Ostrich farming is still in its early days outside Africa, but we hope that ostrich meat will be freely available soon, and before long will be as cheap as beef. Topic 5. Household Gadgets Good evening. Tonight's show comes to you from the Good Home Exhibition in Duke's Court, where we've been trying out some of the latest gadgets on show here and getting our resident expert, Liz Shearer, to tell us which ones are worth buying and which will die a death. Well, hello. Yes, John, I've been investigating four new household gadgets and sorting out the advantages and disadvantages and then really deciding what are must-buys, what are maybe-buys and what are never-buys. <laughs> Let's start with this vacuum flask for keeping drinks hot. Well, I felt this had quite a lot going for it. Most of all is the fact that it contains no glass and is therefore unbreakable to all intents and purposes. It's made of stainless steel, which is guaranteed for 20 years. <laughs> Hope that's long enough. <laughs> and it's true what the manufacturer claims, that it does maintain heat for 18 hours. So that's pretty good. On the downside, it really works out to be quite expensive and, much more surprisingly, it unfortunately leaves a strange taste, you know, when you've drunk from it. So, all in all, my recommendation would be it's got plenty of advantages, but it is rather expensive, so I'd say you should maybe buy it. Moving on to a natty little device, the whistle key holder. Basically, this is where you whistle 
and the key holder gives off a high-pitched noise and flashes light, so you can find it. One advantage of this model is that it also has a small light. You press the button, and this means you can find keyholes easily. I also felt the small size was a real advantage. Now, on the weaker side, I did find the noise unpleasant, which I'm sure the designers could have done something about. And I found that it didn't work through metal, so it's mainly useful finding in coat pockets, cushions, etc. But taken as a whole, I thought it was a masterpiece of design and would highly recommend it. The third gizmo is called the Army Flashlight because it was developed initially for military use. It works by squeezing the handle to generate the power. Its advantages are that it can be used for outside activities and also, and this is one of the surprising features, it does work underwater. My main objection to it though was, although it did work in these conditions, this model gave off a weak light. So my recommendation, I'm afraid, would have to be to avoid this one. The decoy camera was last on my list. This is a fake video camera which you fix to your wall to scare off burglars. The advantage of this model is something which makes it look very realistic. It's flashing light. On the downside, it was quite difficult to fix to the wall. However, burglary is such a major problem these days that it is worth the effort. So, this gets my strong recommendation. OK, thanks for that, Liz. And now... I'd like... Topic 6. Environmental Noise Good afternoon. I'm Paula Bundle, and I am giving you the lectures on environmental noise this term. Today, we're going to look into the effects of noise on a planned housing estate in a particularly difficult part of the new Manchester Park area. This site is not as bad as some I have researched in the past. The Blacktown Airport is closed from 6pm to 7am, and this is a great advantage to the site. The only noise after dark is from the highway, and the traffic is somewhat reduced between 7.30pm and 5.30am. So the people most affected by the noise will be, I expect, housewives. By the time most of the students and workers have arrived back home in the evening during the week, the noise will have abated to a fairly large extent. The weekends are still a problem, of course, but the traffic is certainly reduced on Saturdays to a large extent, and even more so on Sundays. Of course, modifications to houses will be necessary at a site like this, and they come at a significant cost to the developer and home buyer. The modifications I'm about to outline will add about $25,000 to the price of a newly built house. That will still mean a cheaper house than in a less noisy and more desirable area. A bit of background would not go astray. I understand that you are all familiar with the proposed development site at Manchester Park. It's a particularly difficult one in terms of noise with the highway along the eastern perimeter and the Blacktown Airport not three kilometres away to the north. Of course, those nearest the highway will be the worst hit, with heavy traffic noise as well as the noise from the light planes overhead. As you all know, the normal noise threshold for private housing is 55 decibels. At this site, the levels have been recorded as high as 67 decibels. The construction of the houses has to be somewhat modified from houses in most areas. In the houses on the highway and in the noisiest areas of this site, there will be a need for specialised double glazing and special acoustic seals will have to be fitted to the doors. All exterior doors in this especially noisy pocket will have to be solid core wood doors with hinges. Every house built on this site, not just those adjacent to the highway or nearest to the airport, will require high-density insulation materials in the roof. Not only will all the roofs need insulating, the exterior walls will be required to be double brick. 
All ceilings will require double thickness plasterboard to be used in the construction. In the noisiest areas, mechanical ventilation will have to be installed in the exterior walls. In those areas with sealed windows, it will be necessary to fit fans with absorbers to cut out the noise in those particular houses. Air conditioning units could also be fitted in the ceilings of such houses, but this is substantially more expensive than fans and may not be needed on this site. Coming back now to the double glazing I mentioned before, specialised double glazing requires a larger air gap between the inner and outer glass than normal double glazing. The gap must be at least seven centimetres. The thickness of the glass is also a factor, eight millimetres on the outside and six on the inside pane. It's essential that the glass be thicker on the outside than on the inside and that the gap between the panes of glass be a minimum of seven centimetres. Obviously, the noise factor will have to be taken into consideration with the layout of the houses. Living areas will have to be designed at the back of the houses, away from the highway. Bedrooms and living rooms will have to be built towards the back. And for those houses closest to the highway, two layers of plasterboard will be needed for the interior bedroom walls. Those rooms constructed at the front of the houses should be garages, laundries, kitchens, bathrooms and dining rooms. I have come to the conclusion that this development should go ahead, but with various acoustic modifications according to the position of the block in relation to the highway and intersection.